good afternoon, everybody. Hope you've had a, a good afternoon and got a good bite to eat, maybe a nap. And uh, maybe I should say good evening because that's when you'll be seeing this. But uh, I hope you all got to enjoy the service this morning and uh, the, or, or have some big plans for tomorrow for Memorial Day to grill something or to at least go to Burger King, get a hamburger or something grilled somewhere. And uh, just enjoy our Memorial Day and celebration of those that have, have fought for us and died for us. And we're so thankful for that. And we're just thankful for the Lord showing up this morning, I feel like, and blessing us. And uh, just looking forward to tonight. And we're getting into our Bible study here. And uh, we're, we're still in our evangelism study, and we will be for a while. So we're going to keep posting these videos. If you say, well, I, I would like to have the music and stuff like that, and the videos aren't the same as the live service, and I understand uh, if you can all, if you can in any way come and be with us on Sunday night, come with us, and we would love for you to be here and have some discussion, and I'm, I'm trying to get better about that have, uh, and have some discussion and talk through this soul winning, because the last part of our study from here on it is really going to be more, uh, we want to talk about, talk about maybe some struggles we have with soul winning, if not, or what, what are we strong at, what are some tips we give each other as we go through our study, so I uh, highly encourage you to, to come if you can, uh, but I understand there are several of you that just cannot, and uh, so I, I do not want to leave you uh, without anything. I want you to be able to join in our study. Um, so if you will, you can turn your Bibles to John chapter 4, and uh, we're, we're going to finish the lesson we started last week, and that's the means in which we evangelize. This is our new section, uh, how we're going to carry ourselves in evangelism. And uh, how we're going to go about it, uh, our mannerisms, if you will. And we talked about what Jesus did. And we really summed up everything, the ten different points, and we're not going to go back over them, that, that Jesus used on the woman at the well. And he didn't have a ten-point system. Um, but he prioritized evangelism when he talked. He prioritized people knowing that he was the Christ. That's the good news, right? That's the first part of the good news. That's... That was the first part that was there when he was there, that he was the Messiah. Now, we share what he did for us, his death, burial, and resurrection uh, for the salvation of our sin. So we want to follow that, and, and we want to, to, I guess you say, imitate our master as we evangelize as he did. Now, on the flip side of that, in the very same story, we see a negative example to, to not follow. That's a double negative, I guess, but... We see something not to follow in the, the apostles' example. Now, they had to grow. They also didn't have, um, the, 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 they weren't full of the Spirit as they were baptized. He came and left from them. So I know there was a difference in their power and, and empowering before Pentecost. But they were people like we are. And they were growing and they were learning and they were trying to figure out what the Lord was teaching them. And although we do have the benefit of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, we can find ourselves in the same example uh, of the apostles. And, and so we talked about what Jesus did, and we want to talk about now what we need to watch out not to do based on what Jesus did. And then we want to end our discussion tonight on the number one tool. And, and you'll see why I, I hesitate to say tool in a moment, but the number one means we want to use in evangelism the number one means how we want to carry ourselves when to speak what to speak how to speak all those things uh, we'll, we'll talk about that there at the end so let's pray ask God to open our hearts and minds to the scriptures and uh, just just come be with us as, as we go through his word father we thank you again for this day we thank you Lord for your, your blessed salvation uh, that you purchased for us through the Lord Jesus and we just ask for your touch upon us tonight as we go through your word Please open up our hearts and minds and help us to see what you'd have us to see. Lord Jesus, we want to imitate you. We want, we want to do what you've done, Lord, and, and, and so so effectively and efficiently as God on this earth. Lord, please just show us the, the holes in our own lives. Show us the things that we need to do better for you. Give us a heart for souls, just as you have a heart for souls and had a heart for us. Thank you for being so good to us. We ask you to bless us now as we go on in your service. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So let's pick up reading the, the last part of this John chapter 4 story. Uh, Jesus has been talking with the woman at the well. And uh, here, here comes in verse 27, the apostles come back. He says, And upon, his, upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. 
Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or what talkest thou with her? Why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her, uh, and went her way into the city and said unto the men, Come see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meantime, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his works. He had a he had a, a priority to take care of. See not ye that there are four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look unto the fields, for there are white already to the harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit into eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, but that whereon you, you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you are entered in their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all the things I ever did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own words. And he said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. They came back and they looked at what Jesus was doing, and then of course they missed part of the conversation. But all they did was see a woman, and they saw a Samaritan. And we talked about this some last week. Jesus looked past who she was and what she was and saw her need. They completely overlooked her spiritual need. And if we're not prioritizing evangelism, we will see people, and we will see their problems. We will see who they are and what they are and forget who we are and what we're supposed to do. Uh, we all have some kind of... And I don't mean prejudice like you think of this in a bad way, but we all have some kind of prejudice towards people. And what I mean by that, and prejudice is probably not the right word, some people catch us off guard. Prejudice is probably the wrong word. Uh, some people we don't feel as comfortable around. We wouldn't naturally say we don't like this group of people, we don't like those people, but there's people that we may not feel as comfortable and open around. Uh, we may look at them and say they're dirty or they're not clean or they're this or that. Um, so I'm not saying there's hate in your heart because we, we all have those people. We have to stop ourselves and say, hey, don't, don't think like that and, and don't, definitely don't act in any way that would offend them. And we have to be very careful. Um, and, and a good example of that would be that, that you know, most of us, if a serial killer come in and got out of jail and got saved and come in and set in, we would all be a little comfort, un uncomfortable to speak with them. There's always somebody for us that we would run across in some situation we would get in that would throw us off guard. But what we need to do, why we, we do need to think about our safety, I understand that, but at the end of the day, we're here, and the Lord is the one keeping us safe, and he is the one who's put that person in our lives, and, and Jesus wanted them to come back and see what he had done. I really believe that. But all they saw is a woman, and they saw who she was, and wonder what in the world she's doing. So if we don't prioritize evangelism, we'll look at people, we'll see them, and we'll find a reason not to talk to them. So in not seeing her need, they ignored what Jesus was doing. Even if they didn't see the need, they were asking him and worried about him eating. They, they didn't think about, well, why did you talk to that woman? See, they didn't even ask. They didn't say anything about the woman. They just came back and be like, what are you doing? They weren't saying, hey, what happened? What was this all about? It wasn't this big discussion that, that John wrote down that they had with him. They, they put it this way. This is what the author said in the book. When we refuse to open our eyes to the needs of the world around us, we do ourselves a double disservice and lose on two levels. Not only do we lose the joy of being used by God to make a difference, but we also lose out on noticing what God is doing. So they missed their opportunity, and they also missed out on opportunity to be on the same page with God. And we, we don't ever want to miss those opportunities. How many doors do we miss because we have spiritually uh, closed eyes? We just we walk in, we look around, and we don't we don't see anything. We don't pay attention. Uh, and the sad part is that we miss way too many opportunities uh, for that very reason. 
they missed the obvious opportunity. They talked to him about the meat. They come in and they concerned themselves about the meat and not about her. They, they, so they failed to see that the spiritual harvest was ripe. That's the other part about being prioritizing is, is Jesus said that there's, there's those that have worked, there's those that have planted. The harvest is ready now. And one of the big deals about realizing and, and prioritizing evangelism, and I, I read this, uh, I don't know who this pastor is, but they had something on Facebook, and somebody shared his Facebook post, and he put this, he says, Don't leave your house this morning unless you're ready to be used of God to win somebody to Christ. Don't be ready unless you're ready to witness. Don't leave unless you're ready to witness. That's prioritizing. And that made, it, that made an impact on me the other day. It, it, it ain't left my mind. Are we ready the moment we leave our house to tell somebody about Jesus? Or are we just uh, dilly-dallying around with our day and just going about our business? And Well, if it happens, it happens. And that's not making a priority out of it. And when we don't make that priority, we miss it. And we fail to see that there's going to be people we run into all day long that we have no idea how we could witness to them Maybe even have to start a conversation. But they're there, and they need to be witnessed to. And we need to do something. We need to be the one to say something. And we're missing opportunities, and they, they certainly missed the, the, the spiritual harvest that was, that was sitting right in front of them. Since they didn't realize the harvest was right in front of them or wasn't thinking about it at that time, they failed to see their role in the harvest. Uh, you remember we talked about spiritual farming and how somebody plants, somebody sows, somebody uh, waters, and somebody sees the fruit. But it always comes from God. He, it's his work throughout the whole process, but there may be many people that work in a person's life for them to be saved. Or the Lord may do it all at one time. E- either way, that we all have a role to serve for, people's, for people to get saved. Maybe saying, maybe praying, uh, maybe leading that person to Christ. But we all have a role, and if we're not prioritized, we're, we're not going to be thinking about what role could I play in this person's life. And this is what we mean by means. Like, how do we take everything we talked about so far and actually put it to use? Because I've enjoyed, I've been challenged at some points in our salvation study and how we would do this and should we say this or that. But it doesn't do us any good if we just lead this study and just go back to how we were. That would be quite a shame. And that's what we want to talk about now for the next few weeks, and this is what this is. Is this is how Jesus did it, and if Jesus did it, this is the opposite. And if you're like me, this is where we usually find ourselves. We find ourselves making excuses. We find ourselves failing to see uh, what, what, what our job is right in front of us. They underestimated the size of the harvest. They underestimated the power of one is another way to say it. I want to read this to you. and It's a longer passage, but, you, but you'll enjoy it. It's in this book. One salesman, it's the story of a man, one salesman and Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball, led a young man named Dwight to Christ. Dwight Moody became a blazing evangelist who, it is said, led one million souls to Christ in a short lifetime. One William Chapman received the assurance of his salvation after talking with Moody and went on to become a noted evangelist himself. The drunken baseball player, Billy Sunday, was an assistant to Chapman before becoming the most famous evangelist of his day. One of the fruits of Sunday's ministry was the forming of a group of Christian businessmen in Charlotte, North Carolina. This group brought the evangelist Mordecai Ham to Charlotte in 1934. A tall, awkward youth named Billy Graham was converting during those meetings. To, uh, according to his staff, as of 1993, more than 2.5 million people had stepped forward at his crusades to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Three millions, uh, three million, hold on, millions of souls trace their spiritual lineage back to the influence of one man, a simple Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball. Someone said, to the world you may just be one person, but to one person you may be the world. To this we might add, to you they may seem like just one lost soul, but to God that may be a soul who can shake the whole world. I thought that was so important to read and to share from our author because they underestimated the size of that woman, but what did that woman do? That woman went back and she told, so she went back and told all the men, she says, 
come, come meet this man that has told me everything about my life. Is this not the Christ? And they brought him back, and I read you in the passage where they come back, and, and some believe, and more believed. And then more came back and believed. And then they told the lady, she says, they said, now we believe not because you saw him, but because we saw him. And to see, we need to get people to see in Jesus. And we never know that one person that we get to influence for Christ, how they may turn out and go win thousands or millions or here, millions. And then they led the, the thousands and they led the millions again. Really, three evangelists, three, four evangelists come from one man's fruit, from, from one Sunday school teacher just being faithful in giving the gospel. And see, that's what we make about this, this, this evangelism. We think it is only going out in the highways and hedges, which that's a part of it as we go. Uh, that, that's what Jesus meant when he says, go you therefore. As going as you go, as you go along, as you live life, as, as this this is what you're supposed to do. So no matter where we're at, we preach the gospel, right? And we think of outside of the church, but remember inside of the church too. I, I know y'all know this, but I got four children, and three of them need to be saved. One of them's already accepted Christ. And we need good Bible teaching, gospel-loving Sunday school teachers to, to tell little boys and girls about Jesus. Mom and daddy's telling them about Jesus at home. You better believe it. We're praying for them and praying with them. But we need people to be faithful just to tell people about Jesus right here in the church. To be evangelistically minded. And see, that's the means of our evangelism is to prioritize how big of a deal that is. Not just where they come from a Christian home. They'll hear, yeah, but see, kids, they tone out sometimes what mom and daddy says. But they've heard mom and daddy say it enough. It's just like church members that, that may not get saved. They may hear me preach a gospel message a thousand times. And then an evangelist comes in, and it's a different voice, and the Lord used them to bring them to Christ. That wouldn't hurt my feelings at all. It tickle me to death. We need somebody to be that other person. We need somebody just to be faithful to give the gospel. We need somebody to realize that, that the size of the harvest is huge. It starts with one person, but one person multiplies to two. And he gave an example that if you took a chessboard, and you started on one side, and you put one seed, and then you, you doubled that over here, two, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, and 32, and 64. I imagine, I believe he said there was 64 squares on a, a, a checkerboard, and he said by the end of it, you have more than a fit on that board. That's grains of rice. And that's how this multiplication thing works, and that's how the first church blew up. Uh, if you remember Peter, he preached, and, and he did change, and that's what we're going to talk about next, but he preached, and 3,000 got saved in one sermon. Let's go ahead and go there now. We know one, and we get our mind right on prioritizing. The disciples, when they, when they were baptized in the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, they changed. They no longer missed those opportunities. They, 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 they were now being used. They were being filled. They were being bold. They saw thousands get saved. They walked by. And no longer were they worried about the man begging for money and just worried about that he was begging for something. They saw the need and they healed. They healed him in Jesus' name. They prayed and they served. They stood boldly instead of running. So there's hope for us that we can change from where we are because I don't know uh, exactly y'all's story, but we're not all as good as soul winners as we could be. We're, we're not. That's just the fact of the matter because we're not going home yet. We're not, we're not progressed to the level that we need to be. We can always get better, and we always need to progress and to, to prioritize evangelism more in our life. And the apostles did that. They got better. And we need to realize that, that getting better means that we may be able to make a difference. And we have to be careful about this because if you, if you take 12 Bible classes on soul winning, doesn't mean you're going to be the next Billy Graham. It doesn't mean you're going to be an evangelist. It doesn't mean God's going to call you to do anything other than you're going to be prepared to do whatever the master wants you to do. And that's what we want to be prepared for is that God went through all the trouble to save us and he's changed our lives and we want to be used for him. And the idea that he may use us to save one soul should be enough to put our minds to the, to the, to the task of figuring out evangelism 
and sharing our faith. All of this relies on the major means that I told you about. This morning, tonight's message is just a little bit shorter. And that means is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we have to remember, he's not an it. He's not a ghost. He's not a thing. Um, he's not a, a mere essence or wind. He is the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is God. He is co-equal with the Father and with the Son. He shares all the same uh, characteristics as the Father and the Son. We hear about the Father and the Son, of course, more in scriptures. So we hear about the Father sending the Son. We hear about the Father uses the Spirit. If we're not careful, we'll, we'll think of the Holy Spirit and we'll start calling him an it. And, but he is a him. He has a personality. He can be grieved, right? He can be quenched. And when Jesus said, Lo, I am with you to the end of the world, in, in Matthew uh, 28, 20, he said he's going to be with us. Who he's talking about being with us is God in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we must remember that as we go witnessing, as we think about sharing the gospel, this is not a task that we can perform our own. So the means we want to use is we want to have our mind and our heart set in the right direction, but we want God to lead us in every, every aspect, in every facet of our witnessing. I want you to remember in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, these verses, Jesus was talking about the, the Holy Spirit when he would come. He says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. See, it's the Holy Spirit's work. It's his job to convince people of sin, the sin of unbelief in Christ, righteousness, and judgment. That's what he does. We want to make sure that we don't try to do the work of God without God. And when we look at the daunting task of looking at people and feeling responsible for them to hear the gospel, it can be just that. It can be daunting. It can be overwhelming. You can automatically feel defeated before you start, and rightfully so. And we can really look at ourselves and see our failures and see our personalities. And, and as much as I love to talk to people, like, and I am a people person, I don't like to push people. Uh, I don't like to feel that I'm indoctrinating people and those kind of things. And you say, well, that sounds kind of ridiculous. You're a preacher. It does. I want to tell people about my friend Jesus. And I want to tell them how about how they can be saved too. But I don't want to seem like a cult leader. And, and I, I hope you know what I'm talking about. And so sometimes I may not be as bold as I need to be. And I'm just being open with you here. You, you fill in the blank here at your situation. Because I get to thinking about that other person. And, and that, that is just a little backwards how I think like that. And that's my flesh. It's not me trying to be ugly, but it, it's working against God. See, but if I don't realize that and realize that I have to prioritize telling him. And if it makes me look like something to them, that's fine. I need to look like whatever I need to look like. As long as they hear about Jesus, I can't control that. But if, when I look at that and I see my failures, I want to just stop trying. I don't like failing. I don't know about y'all. I don't like doing things that I'm not good at or that I can't get better at. So when I look at soul winning and how many times I've failed, how many opportunities I've missed, I'm not saying this that boastfully, please. No, I, I, I'm, like it hurts my heart. Sometimes I get back in the car. I've told y'all before, and I hope y'all do too. And you, you just know you've missed it, and you just have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. But see, that's where we look at this, and we look at the example of the apostles, and we look to God and say, you know what? I missed it today, but you don't want me to keep missing it, and I desire to do what you'd have me to do. Would you give me the courage to open my mouth? And not be cowardly. 
to open my mouth and to say what needs to be said, how it needs to be said with your boldness. If you remember in Acts chapter 4, the, the church there, they had heard of the apostles beating and telling them not to speak about Jesus. And they, well, they got together and they got to praying. And they asked God for boldness to spread the gospel, the boldness to speak about Jesus. And boy, he gave them boldness. And see, this is the most important thing to realize about God is that all that power is there inside of us already. We don't need to take that as a sign that something's wrong with us. That I, I just don't have this boldness of this and that. That means uh, something's wrong with me or I'm not called to this. No, the power of God sits within you, but you need to ask. The power of God sits within you, and you need to take it as, as your provision. Sometimes, uh, put it this way, you'll never have the strength you need to witness until you make the first step to witness. you got to ask and trust him for it, then you need to step out on faith and do it. And w- without the Holy Spirit, none of that would be possible because he is the link inside of us of Jesus walking with us and giving us the strength and the power to do that. He gives life and he enters that life and, and he knows what needs to happen for life to come to that person. He knows what question is on that person's mind. He knows the scales that the devil's put over their eyes and he's the one that can remove them. We certainly want to follow his lead. This means, one, we must be filled with him. Now, let's make this very clear. We're not going to get too deep into this. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes when a person is born again. There are several occurrences in the New Testament, uh, well, in the book of Acts, where at different times they they got saved, and then somebody came along and laid their hands on them. But that is not a doctrinal statement. There's, there's some dispensational acts going on in the book of Acts. For instance, the Samaritan revival that probably, that probably started right here in John chapter 4. And Philip went back, and when they had the revival, these people already believed in the Messiah, and it blew up. Peter and John came later on when they heard what was going on and, and prayed, and they all received the Spirit of God. That's not a normal occurrence. That's something that happened in the book of Acts. That's very important because Romans chapter 8 tells us that if we have not the Spirit of Christ, then we are none of His. We have to have the Spirit. He's what makes us, if you remember in our study in Ephesians a few weeks ago in Ephesians 1.13, he says, "In, in whom you were sealed, after that you believed. So you were sealed with the Spirit the moment you believed. But what we're talking about here is being filled with the Spirit is you having your life put to one side and being completely led and directed by the Spirit of God. Here's here's how that happens. Every known sin is confessed. That doesn't mean you don't sin, but it means that you're walking with God in a manner that when he points out sin, you say, yes, Lord, I don't want that. I want you. And you'd be filled. Several times before the Apostle Paul spoke in the book of Acts, I didn't write this down, I have to go back and get you the verses, it says that Paul stood filled with the Spirit. speaks of the other apostles in the same way in the book of Acts. That's what he's talking about in Ephesians 5.19, Be not drunk with wine, which is, which is excess or which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit of God, which means in the Greek, be being filled. It's a constant thing to make sure that we are full of the Spirit and not full of ourselves. We don't get more of him. He gets more of us. And I hope that makes sense. This is how some people are easier, easily, seemingly a whole lot easier, di- uh, easily directed by the Holy Spirit than we are. They may be full of the Spirit, and we may not be. That's why at times in your life, it feels like God was driving the boat. It's like he was, he was moving you here and there, and boy, your whole life just felt like God was just moving everything. And I guarantee if it's different now, you can go back and look at some small sin, big sin, out of church, whatever it is, out of fellowship, and you can see where you're not filled with the Spirit. But for us to be effective and us to be able to hear, we have to be full of the Spirit of God. That takes holiness and commitment. It takes also learning and growing. Even when we're filled with Him, we, we must know and how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. It tells us in John chapter 16 that, that He speaks of Him. 
and not with an audible voice. He's, he's inspired scripture to reveal Christ to us. And as we are witnessing, as we are working for him, he illuminates the scripture we put in. He illuminates his word that we, we have studied and put in our minds and our hearts and shows us what to say. All of you that have witnessed any point in time, and our author said this, and man, I, I said amen sitting in my office. You've been talking with somebody, and then it's really like God took over. And not you, you didn't want to talk, and God used you as a puppet. But it kind of felt like that in, in this way. Words started coming out of your mouth that sounded a lot smarter than you think yourself to be. And, and, and the, it was making sense to the people in a way that you didn't think you could make sense to the people. And I hope that makes sense. I, I didn't phrase that maybe as good as I wanted to. But the Holy Spirit, and I say amen because it happens all the time preaching. When I hear the things that I'm saying, I, hear, I see the notes that I've studied, and it's not there. And it, but it's because the Holy Spirit brings to my mind and my heart what I've studied in His Word. And that takes time. That takes being able to listen to Him and knowing it's God. But it also takes that, that, that learning and growing. We must be paying attention to him. So our part is to say, I want to prioritize evangelism. I want to, to go today and, and look for who I can tell about Jesus. His job is to do all the work. Our job is to be willing every day. And that surrender to God and that surrender to him. And that's where we fail. And that's, that's where this study is pushing me. And I want to get better. I want to get better. And I hope you do too. I hope it's a blessing to you. And I, I'm not trying to, I don't know, I, I guess I make myself too vulnerable to you guys sometimes, but I think you all understand. I hope you appreciate that. And hopefully you can, you can, uh, you know, jump on with me here and realize we're just people. And you all know me good enough to know that. But we ought, we ought to try and we got to prioritize this stuff that we're learning. We ought to prioritize the commands of our Lord if we ever want to see people get saved. And I want our church to grow, but our church isn't going to grow because we, we start something new, or we come up with some new idea to get people here. Uh, we could have all kinds of attractions if people come for the attractions. I've already seen that. But they don't stick. People stick with the church when they become part of the church. And I don't mean joining the church by walking the aisle. I mean joining the church by becoming the body of Christ, accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's our aim. To do that, we must rely on the works of the Spirit of God. Hopefully, this is, this is a, a lesson tonight that you're already acing. We want to talk about this tonight with those that come. But I guarantee there's an area somewhere where we need to prioritize evangelism a little bit more. We need to push on a little bit more. Maybe we've been stuck in a certain area with people, and we need to pray harder that God will give us an opportunity to go deeper in sharing the faith with them. Deeper. And, and just pray for God's power to open their eyes to the gospel. But we got to prioritize it. we got to be willing. I hope this is a blessing to you. I hope that it's a help to you. I hope you guys have a, a good night and a wonderful Memorial Day tomorrow. Enjoying whatever festivities you're going to do. Lord willing, we will see you guys on Wednesday. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for this day. Thank you for your love and mercy. We just ask for your blessing upon us now as we go on. And Lord, these that have watched online, we ask you to bless them in their lives. And Lord, please open the door for witnessing for them. And Lord, just help them as well as me. Help us to hear your voice, to feel your touch, Lord, and to just to be bold in sharing your word. Lord, that's what you saved us to do. And I just pray that we fulfill the purpose you saved us for. Thank you for loving us and all you've done for us, Jesus. And we ask this in your name, Lord. Amen.